Are you seeking... Welcome to Character Creation Cast, a show where we discuss and create characters, the best part of role-playing games, with guests using their favorite systems. I'm one of your hosts, Ryan, and this episode my co-host Amelia and I welcome some of the cast from Protean City Comics, a Masks actual play podcast, for a very special episode. First up, we have Brandon Leon Gambetta. Hey, how are you doing? He is the GM for Protean City Comics. And he can also be found on the Stop, Hack, and Roll podcast. And he is the creator of, let me know if I get this right, Pasión de las Pasiones? Yeah, Pasión de las Pasiones. Uh, You had it totally, perfectly, completely great. Don't worry even a little bit. That was a wonderful (laughs) introduction. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you for being here. And I'm so glad to be here. I'm really, really excited about Creation Cast. I've been kind of like just bouncing up and down, ready for it to drop. So I can't wait. I'm super pumped. (laughs) Well, we are very excited to have you here too, Brandon. All right. Joining Brandon is James Malloy, editor for Protean City Comics, and he also plays Puck using the Doomed Playbook. (laughs) Hello. Welcome. And also joining us is Elspeth Denman, who normally plays as Penance using the Nova Playbook. Yay. Yes. (laughs) Normally, because now that's not the only thing. Yes, I, I know you've also played another character, which we will not spoil if you have not gotten to Protean City. Yeah. <laughs> Hashtag no spoilers. <laughs> Hashtag no spoilers. Except for, uh, we're actually here to discuss character creation for Masks, A New Generation. It is a Powered by the Apocalypse superhero role-playing game system created by Brendan Conway. And it is published by Magpie Games. Ooh, ooh. All right. Welcome to the episode, everyone. We are very excited to have you with us. Thank you so much for having us. I'm really Yeah, we're bummed. stoked to be here. <laughs> Thanks for the invitation. <laughs> um, Brandon, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and other projects that you are doing right now? Yeah, sure thing. Uh, I'm Brandon Leon Gambetta. I am uh, one of the creators of the Stop, Pack, and Roll Network, which has... Protean City Comics, which is a Masks actual play show, and the uh, titular podcast, Stop, Hack, and Roll, which is a game-making podcast. Uh, I also just dropped the ash can for Pasión de las Pasiones, which is a telenovela game powered by the apocalypse, through the company uh, Magpie Games, which is also the company that made Masks. So I'm trying to keep everything kind of in one little circle and milieu, <laughs> if you will. <laughs> Just easier and to spend as much now. time as possible with Brendan Conway. Is that, that's <laughs> yeah, it. the more time I can spend with Brendan Conway, the better, uh, because he is an absolute delight. He's wonderful. He's, he's not on Twitter, which is very unfortunate. I know. Yeah. I keep trying to get him on Twitter um, because <laughs> I, I have reg- pretty regular meetings to talk because he's actually my mentor for Pasión de los Pasiones. Um, and just about every meeting we have, I try to pressure him into getting on Twitter. Well, thank you so much for being here, Brandon. Um, How about you, James? Uh, Could you tell us a bit more more about yourself and any other projects that you might be working on? All right. Well, pretty much I do a lot of the same things as Brandon. Um, We do Stop, Back, and Roll, a podcast about game design. I play Puck on Party and City Comics, as well as produce and edit and um, help Elspeth make art and... All sorts of other cool stuff. Um, I'm sometimes GM. Sometimes I GM. Sometimes I GM. Um, I make terrible uh, short games about dinosaurs and being a dinosaur teen. Uh, <laughs> um, but that's uh, I think that's pretty much it. That's me in a nutshell. We're gonna have to circle back to that. <laughs> <laughs> they're delightful. They're, they really they're, are. They're real delightful. They use children. I use. I try to make them use children's games as their game mechanics. Oh, <laughs> nice. Um, and what about you, Elspeth? What else do you have going on? Tell us about yourself. I mean, this is kind of it. I blame these two for dragging me into this universe and making it so fun that I don't want to leave. Um, but yeah, this is this is pretty much it. Yeah, and I'm delighted to be part of Party and City. I make a lot of the art, and James helps me with that. Um, I may be GMing, maybe. Definitely. Um, GMing. But it's it's. <laughs> don't you beg me, Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, but yeah, it's mostly just Protean City and and uh, loving every second of it. Awesome. <laughs> well, thank you so much for being here, everybody. Um, how about we go ahead and jump into find out what this game is all about? Yes. Sounds great. Woohoo. What's in a game? Hopefully you guys can answer some of the following questions. Um, so feel free to jump in and discuss where you want. We're just going to, we'll keep it cash. It's fine. Okay. Nice. <laughs> so can you guys tell us a little bit about the setting? Um, what kind of world you play in? That kind of thing? Absolutely. Uh, the core game of Masks of New Generation comes with a really nicely fleshed out, uh, really wonderfully imagined uh, city named Halcyon City which has had four generations of heroes. And so you play characters that are in that fourth modern generation. So there's three generations of heroes before you that have been essentially figuring out how things work, how things are done, what it is to be a hero, where heroes fit into the world. And a big part of the game is not just punching Dr. Crocodile Face, uh, original character, um, <laughs> do not steal. Do not steal. Oh, see, that's my persona. Um, but uh, but punching Doctor Crocodile Face and then working out, hey, did I do the right thing? And like getting pressure from all sorts of the other adults in the city and the other teen peers, and it's it's basically playing superheroes from the ages of fifteen to twenty four, where you're kind of working out your identity still. Wonderful. So and lots of sweet feels to go with it. You get all the teenage angst and high school drama and does she like me? I don't know. Let's pass notes drama. <laughs> we got a special dispensation that allows us to play in a city other than Halcyon City. But I, I do think you need that special dispensation to technically be legally allowed to do it. Because you're a rebel. <laughs> or not recorded. Anarchy. Well, I think you basically covered the next question, is what characters d do in, in the Masks game? Basically, superheroics, teen angst, things like that. Is there anything <laughs> else that uh, your characters uh, kind of focus on throughout the game? Kissing. <laughs> <laughs> not, not actually kissing, wanting to kiss. But I guess that falls under, under the angst there. <laughs> well, and then another big thing that they do is... Um, without getting too much into the core like mechanics of the game, but they, but a lot of the game is about how the heroes not only do heroing, but how they feel about themselves while they're heroing. Yeah. And like, do they feel like they are the big hero who's going to go save people, or do they feel like they're just a delinquent? Um, do they feel like they're dangerous? Do they do they need to be like uh, restrained or or prevented from hurting people, or just are you just some person who's out there trying to do your best? Yeah, it's also got a really good aspect of like growing up. So yeah. that could change the way you feel about your own heroing or the way other people feel about how you hero could change as you grow up. And it really makes good use of these um, aspects, you know, danger, freak, savior, those things to like kind of gauge how you're changing, how you're growing as a person and as a hero. Okay, so if we are sitting down to play masks, what kind of materials do we need to have with us? What do you need to make a character and play this game? So you're going to need to have, to make the character, you need the uh, playbooks. Playbooks are basically like uh, character sheets and classes combined into one thing that gives you the sort of archetype story you're telling rather than saying you are big punchy dude. Um, There are a multitude of playbooks. I don't know exactly how many they're off the top of my head. Maybe eight. And each of them is basically a two-sided sheet of paper that has the all the information you need to know about the character in order to make them. There are ten. Uh, there's ten. Yeah. Sorry, I shortchanged us. Um, or I stole two characters from myself. <laughs> or you're just uh, like, two of these are not very good. Don't worry about them. <laughs> I would never say that. One of these is not very good. Um <laughs> James, editor James, please cut that. I know which uh, one it is. Yeah, and I picked yeah. it. <laughs> I've, I don't think you did. I've, I've been a little, I've been a little vocal about about not being a big fan of delinquent. I'm not really sure how it works for. It no, doesn't yeah, that's work 100. That's the oh, that's what you're thinks. doing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it consistently works and is fun, but this is so off topic. Um, so you also are going to need. Ideally, everybody has a pencil with an eraser because this is a game that you do have to erase stuff and recircle stuff and things like that. Oh, and wow. once you, 
Yeah, yeah, especially with how your stats move up and down. They're called labels, and instead of being like a hard and fast thing, I am plus two strong, it's how you view yourself. So you're a plus two danger right now, because you think you're very dangerous. Um, and then the last thing you need is 2d6 for each person, which is two six-sided dice. And uh, the GM doesn't need that, so you can save two of them or give them to somebody else. And uh, that's te- that's technically all you need. Uh, There's a basic moves list also that is necessary at the table, but if you've printed out your playbooks, you've also printed out the basic move list. So, uh, yeah, that's about it. Okay, so what would you say is unique about Masks compared to other games, and especially other Powered by the Apocalypse games? Well, okay, so I can, so it's kind of, I'll I'll take this, Brandon. Um, Sure. It is, uh, it's kind of... Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. It, it's getting into the sort of like second generation of games based off of Apocalypse World. Yeah. And and one of the things that I think it does that even is not true of other games of its generation is how much each of the playbooks are not like classes. They are they are about other things than just what do you do. They are about how you do them. Yeah. Um, they are about the about the like. Even like if you go back and look at Apocalypse World, Apocalypse World's playbooks are about well, how do you approach the world? Like, what do you do? You're, if you're the gun lugger, then you lug guns around and you shoot guns. That doesn't tell you anything about what you do as a play, as a character. It yeah. just tells you what you do as a class. But every one of the Masks playbooks tells you what or gives you options and points you in a direction to tell you what to do as a player and helps you reinforce that mechanically. Yeah, the really great thing about how the playbooks are set up is that it really lets you look at what kind of superhero story do I want to be telling, and then you choose the playbook that is telling that kind of superhero story. Mm. So, like, I am probably going to be playing uh, the Janus for this, or creating the Janus for this, because my very favorite kind of superhero story is I have a mask, and I put it on, and sometimes I'm in my normal life, and sometimes I'm not, and that's really scary. Instead of having Archer Guy which doesn't really tell you anything about what's going to happen in your story. This is something that instead tells you, what should I be aiming for? What should I be trying to do? What should I be trying to manage? So that I really get the genre-specific uh, story beats going on. Oh, that's really interesting. Which can take a little bit of getting used to, because it's so easy to like sit down and look at the characters and say, oh, like because on the first page of the playbook is the, the abilities, and to go, oh, I want to play the character that does this X, Y, and Z. But really, when you look at it, like half of the, some of the characters have a lot of the same abilities, because mm-hmm. again, it's not about like, it's not about what powers you have, it's about what you do with your powers. It's about what kind of a person are you? What kind of a teenager are you? It's kind of like if uh, if the Barbarian and Dungeon World had a big list of weapon choices, those would be probably the weapon choices that are like hammer, uh, axe, like, you know, big, scary weapons, and right. that would make sense in the fiction. But if someone came to their GM and said, hey, I want to be a Barbarian that uses a knife, their GM would probably go, yeah, that's okay. And it's the same exact thing with masks. The powers and abilities that are involved in it are actually really secondary to the story that you're trying to tell. There are some things that won't work very well if you're the beacon, which is your bright-eyed, happy kid that just wants to be a superhero so bad and doesn't have a lot of powers, and you say, I can fundamentally change the fabric of reality, that's going to be very hard to tell that story. (laughs) Because everybody believes that you are very powerful. Right. So (laughs) it goes against it. But apart from that, if you say, like, hey, I want to be the transformed and slinging webs isn't an option, can I sling webs? It's kind of the GM's job to say, oh, yeah, cool, yes, you can sling webs, done. So so a lot of the abilities are, at the very least, suggestions of kind of the power level that you're going for with that sort of character. Yeah, and that is actually another thing that I think makes masks really... uh, really different from other superhero games is most superhero RPGs do not handle power disparity very well. And so you can't really have like, you know, uh, the, the Hulk and Hawkeye in the same party Mm -hmm. and in masks, you definitely can. And there's even a playbook about doing that. Yeah. So that's wonderful. (laughs) Like in our podcast, we have a kid who is literally just uh, really good at math and throws some uh, some like uh, mechanical orb things that he's created out of like garbage around his house, uh, and he hangs out with like um, Elspeth's character and mine, who are both uh, like Elspeth is a is a is a witch who throws magic around, and my character like deals with uh, channeling powers from a trickster god. 
So we are on like a totally different power level, but we can still engage in combat and and stories together, and it's 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 interesting, and um, but it's doable and it's 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 uh it handles it very well. I think it's because it this game relies so heavily on relationships, and maybe your power sets are different, or the your history of becoming a hero is different. But maybe you just get along, or maybe you have admiration for each other, or maybe you went through something really traumatic together, and now you're bonded. So that all has to do with you as a person and not as a hero, and that's why these people can coexist and learn from each other and grow together separate from their powers. Part of that also is that instead of having like an HP system where it's like the Hulk has 500 HP and Spider-Man has 400 HP, you all have uh, emotional conditions, which are basically different things that a superhero could feel as they start messing things up. And everybody gets those feelings. So if someone, if you have a character that can be hit by a truck and not have anything bad happen to them, they might still feel like they screwed things up. They might still feel guilty. They might still feel angry or afraid or any of those things. Especially if there's collateral damage or if an innocent person gets hurt, you've got a lot of different conditions you can mark that would, uh, that would be you know something that would put you down a little bit when you are an invincible god, basically. Yeah. Because, I mean, even Superman has feelings. By the way, hit your player characters with trucks is really good GM advice in general. I think I haven't done it enough in Protean City. No. I'm pretty sure that just happened to me. If I have one regret in life, <laughs> that I didn't hit enough people with trucks. <laughs> so before we jump into character creation, um, I want to give everybody a little bit of background on the system and kind of go over a few terms that you'll need to know as we go through this. Um, for all the people following along at home with their character sheets in front of them, anxiously awaiting their chance to, to start <laughs> filling things in. <laughs> um, Masks, a new generation, was kickstarted uh, successfully in late 2015, and it was created by Brendan Conway. Uh, we'll be using everything only from the base game. There are as many different character types as you want there to be, and you can dive into, we can get into those in another episode. Um, but it uses the Powered by the Apocalypse engine for a base. Do you guys want to talk a little bit about that? What does it mean to be powered by the Apocalypse? Sure. I can, I can talk about that relatively intelligently, I think. Yeah, you'd be great I, if at I that. Can't at this point, <laughs> if I can't at this point, it's a really bad sign because I've done no, it a hundred times. <laughs> you're good at it. It's good. So Powered by the Apocalypse means it traces its game genealogy to Apocalypse World by Vincent Baker. Um... Apocalypse World and the Powered by the Apocalypse games use certain ideas as the way to structure your game. Uh, one of the things that it does, one of the most important things that it does, is it divides the role of GM away from someone who's rolling dice and kind of gives them very strict rules on how they're allowed to interact with the world. So the GM has specific moves that they can do um, that happen behind the curtain and help to move the conversation along. Um... Instead of uh, the GM rolling to see, does a goblin hit you, or does Green Goblin hit you, uh, the, that is based on a move that the player is making. And moves are basically setups that have a narrative trigger um, when you directly engage a powerful threat, and then a role associated with it, and then some choices afterwards. And so instead of having to do a back-and-forth kind of... Uh, set schedule of how things are happening instead the game becomes a conversation where so one person starts something and they they it leads into something else and it it snowballs into different moves and the conversation just basically moves from player to player and to the gm and back and all around in a much more organic way that doesn't use things like initiative there are some peripheral things with powered by the apocalypse games that tend to be in there but aren't core to being pbta um, among those are rolling two six-sided dice and adding a stat, and then on a six minus, you have a miss, which means the GM is allowed to make a move. On a seven to nine, you get a soft success, so there's probably some negative thing or consequence that's going to happen. And on a ten plus, you get a full success, where you more or less get what you're looking for, although that can depend a little bit also upon what the move is. 
um, it's perfectly acceptable to have moves where even your 10 plus has really negative consequences if you're going in and doing something that's really big, really scary, really dangerous. And so basically these moves just build you through the narrative instead of having uh, instead of having situations where the roleplay and the combat are separate, the two really have to come together because in order for any moves to trigger, the narrative has to happen first. That makes a lot of sense. I hope it does. <laughs> that was real good, Brandon. Thank you. I've been working on it. <laughs> <laughs> now I know in that... front of the mirror every night. <laughs> I know that uh, Powered by the Apocalypse games, most of them use playbooks. Uh, would you yes. be able to uh, tell us a little bit about what playbooks are exactly? I know you touched on it a little bit earlier. Absolutely. Um, so basically what a playbook is... Okay, here's the dirty little secret about PBTA. There's nothing special about playbooks. The playbooks are a lie intended to make PBTA look different. Yes. Yeah, it, it's it's a huge thing. But... Basically what it is, is it's a character sheet with a bunch of this stuff filled in already. Now, in, <laughs> like, second and third generation PBTA games, now what's important about all of this stuff being inserted already is it really gives you a driving direction. You don't have a sheet in front of you that says, uh, I am good at poisoning people and I'm good at opening locks. I don't know what my story is. Instead, you have a playbook that really tells you this is what this is about, which allows you to get really intricately connected concepts going in a hugely positive way. Um, Monster Hearts is a phenomenal example that it is a game of teen monster romance, and it is secretly about negative relationships. Yeah. And Urban Shadows is another great example. It is about being monsters in an urban setting, but it's also about gentrification and how different groups of people interact with each other and all of that is in the playbook and baked into the playbook in a way that you almost can't avoid it if you're playing your character with any sort of loyalty to the paper okay and then i know in most powered by the apocalypse games uh there's some sort of attribute system i know in masks they're called labels uh now what do what do those exactly mean for those that might not be familiar with that I don't know. I cut labels out of my game. Uh oh. <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm joking. Like, what do I don't the specific be put in a box? You can't label me. <laughs> um, do you mean like what do the specific stats mean in masks? Yeah, or in, in general, ma in masks, what do they specifically mean? So, in masks, you have five labels, um, and everybody has the same five labels. There's a couple of moves that give you an additional one, but I don't think any of them are in the core playbooks. So ignore that. Um, the labels are how your character and the world view your character. So whether it's actually completely true or not is kind of less important than how you view it yourself. The labels are danger, which is how much of a danger you are, how scary you are, how much damage you can do, how unintentionally you can damage the world around you. Freak is how... Uh, basically how different you are. How much do you not fit in? How much do your powers astound and impress people? How much do you fail to fit the human world? Savior is basically the Superman stat. It's how much of a capital H hero are you? How much can you put yourself before others? How much can you make sure that people are safe? How much do you look down on those that would break that and how much contempt do you have for those who can't step up superior is how smart you are how full of yourself you are how much you think you're more clever than everybody how much you can trick everybody um all of those different things and mundane is how much you connect with people how much of a normal person you are how much you're too weak and too normal to be doing these super heroic things but also how much can you connect with another human or another mutant or another alien on a specific emotional personal level so they're a little complicated all of them <laughs> and they what's really cool about them is they shift around a ton during play and so if someone who really matters to you and someone who has or someone who has influence over you or someone who is giving you orders 
uh, and all adults initially have influence over you. Um, if they tell you who you are or how the world works, that shifts your labels. So if, uh, so if you just bashed through a parking garage and smacked a bunch of cars all over the place and everything is blowing up around you, and then afterwards you talk to your mentor and they say, that was, com that was totally stupid, people could have gotten really badly hurt, you are a menace then they're raising your danger and lowering your superior because they're telling you, you are scary and dangerous, you are not smart. Hmm. Yeah, it's very interesting when you put it that way because it, it's not just about does this stat give me bonuses to this, it's actually very defining for your character, it seems. Yeah, absolutely. And a great, like, interesting thing that I've done was I actually sat down before playing uh, for this podcast because I knew we were going to be doing a lot of uh, long-term play and I sort of said like what does my character do when his savior is really high what does he do when his mundane is really high how does he see the world how does he how does he act what what are the kinds of things he'll do in combat how will he be a hero yeah. what kind of and then and like I made up this cool matrix so I could so as things change in in uh in in the game I can say okay well my so my savior is is pulling up and my danger is coming down so I should probably tweak my my role playing in this way Oh, interesting. That's so much prep that I had yeah. no idea you did. <laughs> yeah, that's very James. Another thing that's really cool with how these labels work is one of the some of the advances you can take as you level up is locking your labels. So if you have decided this is a part of who I am at the this level, then you can hold it there for the rest of the game. Wow. So you get up, you're up to save your three and you get an advancement and you go, yeah, you know what? I am a superhero. I am here to make people safe. Then you can lock in that savior right there and always have that. And that's part of becoming an adult hero who wouldn't have their labels shifting all around because they know who they are. Oh, that's really cool. It's super neat. I love this <laughs> game so much. It's my favorite game. <laughs> and that's why you're here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So I think we did cover pretty much everything that we need to know for character creation. Is there anything else that you think we might need to know or the audience might need to know to begin creating characters in Masks? There's one thing I'd kind of like to highlight, if you don't mind. Oh, please do. Um, so there is the section on the sheet called Abilities that has your superpowers. Yes. And I just want to point out that above that is something called Look, which is basically creating some of who you are. And it includes... It includes race, it includes the kind of clothing you wear, it includes uh, some physical gender look, and it's up there, and that's in this kind of like really important place. Like, it's more important. If you think about how people tend to read, that it's top to bottom, so things up top are really high up there and important, it's right there at the top of that block. And so it, I think, challenges people to not see the world as just cis white heterosexual heroes and really lets you say hey i can exist in this world um before i started playing powered by the apocalypse games i almost never played latino characters and so like having that there on the page where i can say yes i belong in this world i can look at this and see where i belong in this world is really cool and i think really important for broadening the hobby as a whole oh definitely yeah, and I, I like that it really encourages. That. No, that's because I I like that about about this too. As I was looking through the sheets, um, and I like that it's right up front, and that it sort of encourages you to think through that. Because I think that you know, there's the tendency to say like, "Oh, I'm going to play somebody that looks exactly like me," or "I'm going to play somebody that looks like what I see sort of represented in popular media, and probably especially in a game about superheroes." Um, there's a lot of white dude superheroes. Yeah. And so I like that it puts it right up front as, and, and lists out options too. Like it doesn't just have a box for you to kind of fill those things in. It lists out a few different choices for you too. And obviously I'm sure you don't have to pick those things, but I like that you can look at it and it says right away, like, oh, you can be Asian or South Asian and, you know, kind of like puts that idea in your head for you. Yeah. Um, and sort of encourages you to think that way. I feel like by having it be that list too, as opposed to, like you said, just a blank space, like you could easily just like brush past a blank space and never fill it out or never be specific about it. But by having it be a list of options that you have to choose from, it's really like, 
if you don't make choices, then you're really skipping over a big chunk of text on the front page of your playbook. And yeah. so it really and you're just sort of not says even like, trying. Yeah, you should make <laughs> All you one have of to these do is decisions. Circle it. <laughs> So yeah, that's my soapbox about that. Uh, I yeah. think it's really important because I think it it invites people into the hobby. And yeah, that's definitely. something that I think we really need to do. Oh, definitely. All right. And before we get into the meat of this episode, uh, we do have a special message for our listeners. Uh, we actually talked beforehand, us in the, the cast of Protean City, and have agreed that these characters that we're going to be making are going to be canon in Protean City Comics world in some way, shape, or form. Uh, correct me if that's changed in the last, like, two hours. No, that's totally on base. Um, <laughs> they will at very least be, uh, they'll very least be NPCs existing in the world that we'll be able to pull in at some point. But I think more importantly, when we get a chance to play with you folks Ooh. at some point, which we still are working out some of the technology for, uh, then this might be a good way to jump in. Yeah. Oh, definitely. And we will have all the work done already, so... Yeah, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, so if you are listening now and you're not listening to Protean City Comics, if you like these characters, you better start listening to Protean City Comics so you're all caught <laughs> up by the time these characters are introduced. I've actually got a couple of ideas already of ways I'd like to bring them in, so <laughs> we'll, we'll see where they go, but I, I'm already thinking about it. See, that does not surprise me with your bonus episode talking about all the different timers that you keep track of. <laughs> My madness. <laughs> <laughs> the clocks, all the clocks. All the clocks. <laughs> exactly. Well, with that said, how about we make some people? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Let's make some people. All right. So we had a t bunch of time to think about this beforehand. Um, and I know some of us at the very least have some specific playbooks that we have been looking at. Uh, so who here has an idea of who they want to play? I do. I think we all do. I think yeah, at this I point all... we might all be. Everybody's yeah. all set. This is fantastic. Yeah. yeah. All right. So let's go down the line. Um, Brandon, uh, tell us, uh, what playbook you have chosen. Uh, I have chosen the Janus, which is about having the dual identity between being a mundane person and being a superhero with a mask that hides who they are. Fantastic. Elspeth, how about yourself? I chose The Delinquent, uh, which is about um, pushing against uh, convention, I guess, and being a little bit of a rebel, I think. Brandon probably knows better than me. <laughs> You're totally right. <laughs> what That's it, completely what's it about. What it's totally. About. Yeah. Nailed it. <laughs> and ever since ever since Brandon's talked about it, I want to like I want to see cool new ways to try to use it and we have somebody on our show who does it really successfully, so I did a completely different other thing. That's awesome. Yeah, and I should clarify, the delinquent characters are always amazing. The playbook just isn't my kind of thing. Okay. If editor James left in me hating on the delinquent playbook. <laughs> you are hating on it. You're allowed to have opinions. <laughs> yes, opinions are perfectly valid. And what about you, James? I'm going to play the Transformed, which is all about uh, being a monster and, uh, or at least looking like a monster, and accept and trying to come to the uh, the realization that just because of the way you look on the outside doesn't mean that you have to be a certain way on the inside. And that was somebody that was a normal human at first, and then yeah. got transformed into a monster. Correct. I think I don't actually don't know if they have to be. Um, no, yeah, it says because it says you, you were who were you before and how did you change? Yeah, so you have to have changed. Okay, so you could have changed in, from one monster into another monster, technically. Yeah, in theory. All right, and what are you thinking, Ryan? Um, I'm going to be going with the Outsider, uh, and they are generally a an alien that has come to Earth, and uh, they are basically kind of on the outside of. Uh, Earth civilization. They they're battling between two different worlds: their home world and everything they've known from there, and society here on Earth. From what I'm understanding, Let, correct me if I'm wrong, Brandon. I'm nodding enthusiastically. I forgot you don't have video of me. <laughs> <laughs> Amelia, what are you going to be playing? I am going to play the Doomed, which, having never played this game before, I think is about. Um, it seems. Like, you sort of have, like, a finite end to your powers and, um, you know, are going to explode at any moment. Yeah, exactly. You've got this... Something, something's coming. There's something over your head. There, You've got a sword of Damocles, and 
it's only a matter of time before you're gone. Or you defeat your doom. Ooh. Either way. Is, is that an option? It yes, is. it is. Oh, one yeah. of the advancements. It's one of the advancements. An uh, it's difficult to get to because it's a six plus advancement. So you have to have advanced five times already. Um, is confront your doom on your terms if you survive change playbooks. Wow. However, confront your doom on your terms does not mean you defeat your doom. It means go fight the biggest, scariest, most terrifying thing that could possibly ever happen to you that will almost assuredly doom you. <laughs> but you can try. Yeah. Exactly. But like you can pick the time or like day of the week. Yeah. Maybe. Because yeah. otherwise, if you fill up your doom track, uh, it arrives, you confront it, and you die. Yeah. <laughs> it's the one character that can die. Yeah. Yeah. Well, actually, technically, any character can die. Well, okay, whatever. That one just dies easier, so that's why you picked it. James always mm-hmm. kills his characters. <laughs> it's, it's the character that death is most on the table for, because this tends to be a game that you move away from death. You're not supposed to be playing uh, miniature punishers. You're supposed to be playing superheroes that don't want to kill. And so this is one of the few that really plays in with darker subjects like death. It's almost like as you become an adult, you make better decisions and stop (laughs) being close to death all the time. Yes, it is. I think you're reading (laughs) definitely way too much into this game. I don't think he thought about that at all. (laughs) (laughs) Masks within masks within masks. Meta masks. Maskception. All right. So we've got our playbooks in front of us, hopefully. Mm -hmm. Um, Otherwise, maybe some of you have them memorized and you're just... You know, working through in your head. Um, what do we do next? What do we do? I'm excited. Me? About this. Let's go. Okay. Um, so the first thing that you fill out is uh, under where it... Am I breaking the rules? No, <laughs> am no. Am I supposed to be doing this? Okay. 100%, please. Okay, good. No, we, we definitely invited you guys here to explain this to us. Okay. Because I just wanna... if we knew how to do it, we would just do it ourselves and we wouldn't deal with your nonsense. <laughs> you, there's a and, lot of nonsense and there's to a deal lot. with. Yeah, there's there a lot. are. We're a lot. <laughs> Extra squad. <laughs> Um, so if you look on the first page of your playbook, the one that has the big pretty picture, um, and has like, you know, the name of your playbook underneath that, it has your hero name, your real name, your look and your abilities. You can jump around a little bit in how you do it, but some of these might inform each other. I personally think that the most important thing to hit first is figuring out what your abilities are. I agree. (laughs) I'm nodding. Can I, can I disagree with you? Yeah, please do. Mm Mm-hmm. So, in the, I think that the look and the abilities are definitely one of the first decisions you should make. But yeah. in terms of where do you actually start when you're making your character, the first thing that I always do is I sit down and I read the moment of truth and the team moves. Oh, and, yeah, 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 yeah. And then skim down to the second page and I look at where are the, the default labels, where do the default labels start? And I mm-hmm. look at the backstory questions because those things tell you, the backstory questions start making you think about like, what do you need to make decision, what, 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 what decisions do you need to make um, character wise about, about the character? And, and they will often point you in the right direction of those sort of things that are important about the character. Um, and things like the moment of truth and the team moves tell you how your character, um, relates to the other people on the team and the world around them. And, and like really everything does, but those are sort of the like really concise, uh, quick things. Um, so you can kind of get a sense of if you're totally unfamiliar with the playbook, um, read those things first and get a sense for like, what is it you're going to be doing with this character? So that when you make these decisions, you're not like picking something that's totally wrong for, I mean, it would be hard to pick something totally wrong, but, uh, you, you could point yourself in a, in an incorrect or less than optimal, uh, direction. Yeah. I think James is totally right about that. The moment of truth, especially is in my mind, the guiding, the guiding light for your character. You can always just stop and look at your moment of truth which is basically something that you can unlock that allows you to just have full narrative control for a little while. And what that basically is, is it's when your character does the thing that everybody buys that issue to see your character do. Mm. It's uh, when you are, when you buy the, the squirrel girl takes out Galactus moment. And uh, just having that 
is really lets you know, so what should the rest of my hero stuff look like? What can I now do that I normally can't do? What are the things that I've been trying to do that on that day, I will? Right. So a, a lot of that, from what you guys have just said, uh, sounds like you're kind of narrowing down what playbook you want to go to, but also shaping the background of your character in terms of how you want them to be perceived in the world and mm-hmm. in, in the comic that you're you're effectively creating by playing this game um, yeah how do you want the audience to to see you what powers do you you want them to experience through you that's really interesting exactly i love this game so much <laughs> <laughs> i can start talking about my character if we want to start doing that yeah please yeah, sure that would be awesome um so I am going to be, so like I said, I'm playing, I'm going to, I'm going to make a, a character who is the transformed. Um, and I looked at, so, so my, my, on the abilities part of my sheet, um, it says that you appear obviously and clearly monstrous and that your powers are tied to your appearance. So right off the bat, I know that my character looks kind of, uh, non-human. Um, and so I am going to go with, um, the powers of technopathy and transmutating flesh, which are going to tie into the fact that my character is part car. Oh, (laughs) (laughs) you you joked about being the magic school buzz earlier. And I thought that that was amazing. (laughs) Awesome. (laughs) He's a transformer. Uh, So jumping back up to the look section, um, my character is ambiguous because they are a car. (laughs) <laughs> uh, or car themed um when prior to uh to to the transformation um the character was uh an asian american um he has uh they have piercing eyes which look like headlights and light up like a headlight would um they have uh like there's just the most absolutely gorgeous cherry red metallic flesh um, and they really don't l- wear a costume because they just look like they, like they, they've got like metal skin. They look like they've got headlights there. They've probably got the, like, um, uh, a Ford or, or Chevy or whatever logo kind of on their upper chest. Whoa, James, um, James, 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 James. Yeah. What logo is on their chest? Ford. Okay. Thank you. Cause the character is going to look like a Mustang. Nice. Um, they've got a, uh, like a, an air intake on the top of their head, kind of instead of hair, um, and, uh, little, like, windshield wipers in their eyes, um, uh, side mirrors for ears. (laughs) Oh my goodness. Um, and just a a solid kind of, like, weird glass thing, uh, for their, for where their mouth is. Like, it looks, it looks like it's a mouth, but when they smile, it's just, like, glass, (laughs) like a windshield. To to clarify, you are a car-sized person that looks like a car, not a person-sized person that looks like a car they are a a person-sized person who looks like a car but oh yeah so he's just they're just like they're normal person sized except they have like like a robot person car features okay part of their powers is like the transmutating flesh they can transform into a car ah that makes a lot more sense. Do you have any uh, tattoos or like um, <laughs> pinstriping of any kind? Some sick flames? Um, Bumper stickers. Yeah. Maybe. Is your cat an <laughs> honor <laughs> student? <laughs> Bumper stickers. Yeah. They have a lower back bumper sticker that just says, I'm proud of my <laughs> honor student. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh my gosh that is an amazing thing. and an antenna is... coming out of one shoulder of course oh, it's like a good radio. yeah and so when they turn into a car are they like a full-size car that people can yeah. be inside of yeah yeah <laughs> okay. absolutely they turn into they turn on into a full-on <laughs> red mustang amazing i love it when yeah. they get angry do they just like get so mad they honk or, yeah. or like, they like yeah. they growl like a like an like a like a car <laughs> engine yeah yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, I named my character Tommy Treadwell. Tommy Treadwell. <laughs> oh my god, I love it. How old are you, Tommy? Um, I think that Tommy is a junior in high school. So whatever age that makes that. I think 16, 16, 17. 17 mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That makes Do you sense. have a driver's license? <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, Didn't yeah, really feel so like sorry. it was uh, necessary. 
Um, on the contrary, I think it's very necessary. You're going to be on the road a lot. You don't need a license to walk. <laughs> you don't need a license to like be a car, though. You need a license to drive a car. Exactly. Yeah. You need a registration to be a car. The people that ride inside <laughs> right. you need a license. Yeah. I bet DMV is a nightmare for him. Yeah. <laughs> No, you don't understand it, but I, I am the car. So like yeah. I don't have plate because yeah. like this <laughs> This is <yeah>. me. <laughs> right. Don't <laughs> take <wonderful>. me. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, that is phenomenal. You never have yeah. to worry about parking though. No. Nope. That'd be so nope. convenient. And then the other part of the powers, because he gets two powers, the other one is technopathy. So he kind of like he gets how cars work. He can um I wanna say almost that he can like if he sits in another car, he can almost merge into the dashboard a little bit and like become part of that car. Cool. But absent another car, he just can turn into a full on car, but normally looks like a car. That's Ride awesome. or die. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Wow. Who is up next? I can go. I mean, with... how does how does anyone follow that? <laughs> you follow that one. Yeah, no, seriously. <laughs> right, Get at me with your characters. Well, shut it down. <laughs> So I uh, I chose the Janus, and my hero name is Calavera, and my real name is uh, I should have come up with something. Uh, you never do that. I'm so bad at coming up with names. Um, oh my god, me too. I- Iggy Reyes, um, and uh, if, in terms of look, he is he has like a shifting gender look. When he's in his regular mundane clothes, he looks male. And when he's in his costume, he looks more feminine. Um, and everyone kind of thinks that Calavera is a is a girl. Um, he is a Latino. He wears kind of boring clothing, just kind of sort of like work shirt kind of things and like regular t-shirt and always busted up jeans. His costume is kind of flashy because he's got uh, the full on like painted color. He's got like a full... A uh, character mask with a big uh, sugar skull mask on it, um, yes. and like the bone <laughs> look and everything like that. And so he's got like the full hero uh, bodysuit thing, but his gloves have like finger bones on it and stuff like that. And it's kind of like it looks like it has a uh, like a low V in the front, uh, and there you can see you can see kind of like some bones like from the from the rib cage. Uh, But he is this, like, just this very slight, very skinny guy, and he is drawn a little bit more feminine when he is in his uh, Calavera uh, form. Uh, His powers are, I guess her powers are, because when when he is in Calavera outfit, uh, he uses uh, female pronouns, Um, is he has, she has bone generation and impossible mobility. Uh, so she can do some things where she like uh, can like punch and have then have uh, bone claws come out or like climb with big claws or things like that. Maybe make like a bone shield that comes out. Um, and she can also just uh, morph her body a little bit and anything that basically her skull can fit through, the rest of her can also fit through. Hmm. Uh, so she's like because, a cat. Yeah, yeah. Because she is the Jane, she also has heightened physical abilities, strength, agility, toughness. Um, and but she has to keep these powers very carefully hidden. So like when when uh, when not as uh, Calavera, it's definitely none of those powers should be shown off because they're a little bit obvious when he actually when they're actually used. Um, he first put on the mask because he had a near death experience where he was kind of like unable to protect himself and was uh, out in the street and got into some trouble and then his mutation showed up and he scared the crap out of the people that were ready to hurt him but he realized that he couldn't be like one of these mutants that are on the news all the time one of these heroes that people see because he has a family and he has people that count on him so the team knows about his dual identity but they don't know who he is. Um, so they know that Calavera goes to their school. They don't know who Calavera is. Um, in addition to that, uh, his, uh, his, let's say his uh, grandmother caught him taking off the mask at one point and like stumbling in and was just totally beat up and destroyed. 
and they do not talk about it. Um, when it comes up, <laughs> uh, each of them wants to just shut it down and not think about it and not talk about it because neither of them can really handle it. So I want to ask a question yeah. real quick. Um, it's something that you brought up yesterday when we were talking about playing this game, and I was like, someone explain it to me. Yeah. Um, that the Janus is the only one that really kind of comes with their own secret identity. Yes, but any character can also have a secret identity. Um, the big exception to that is probably the transformed, because it's really important for the transformed to always be obvious. But there's really nothing that can stop you from having a secret identity within any of the other playbooks. Yeah, I just like that this one kind of has its own mechanical sort of, like, situ I mean, not even mechanical, I guess, but like its own situation that it's made to have that. There is actually this great mechanic that the, that the Janus has that's the secret identity. In addition to picking the moves, which I don't know, we'll probably do a little bit later, um, you have a list of obligations. Uh, so uh, for, for Jamie, did I say, no, I said Iggy, because I initially was Jamie Reyes, and then I realized <laughs> that that is a, that is, oh my god, why can't I think of it? Blue Beetle. Blue Beetle, thank you. It's Jaime kept, Reyes. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, Iggy is, um, so basically you choose some things that are the mundane things that you have to keep track of all the time, otherwise you're going to get yourself into trouble. Like Spider-Man has a job and has uh, family stuff and everything like that. Um, mm -hmm. Iggy is a uh, dishwasher, uh, and he, uh, he works at like a little restaurant that his uncle owns. He uh, is caring for somebody at home. Uh, his grandmother lives with him, and uh, she really needs a lot of help. And uh, let's say he also has a significant other um, that I don't know anything about yet. <laughs> I haven't come up with that yet. Dude's got a lot going on. Yeah, exactly. And he puts on a sugar skull mask and goes out at night to fight crime. <laughs> so there's a lot going on for the Janus. <laughs> That's awesome. All right, Elspeth, do you want to go through what sure, you picked? Sure, sure. Um, I'm playing the delinquent. And I picked um, somebody named... Well, my my name name is Cordelia Snort, which is really <laughs> unfortunate for me. Um, and, and Brandon's still laughing. <laughs> she said her last um, name was Snort. <laughs> it is. Yeah, it's wrong. Um, and her hero name is The Idealist. Um, she is uh, kind of ethnically ambiguous and she's not totally sure how far all the different lineages go back because her parents are both mixed and she's mixed all the way back that she knows. I'm sure there's some African heritage, some Native American. There's there's a lot of stuff going on in there, so she just doesn't even bother anymore. She's uh, beautifully, perpetually tan and with uh, long dyed green hair um, because that's cool. Um, she wears a backward baseball cap that has a broken heart on it. And she's a sophomore in high school. She has big, wide eyes, and they're dark, dark brown, like almost black. So it's like really intimidating when you look at her. And uh, she wears um, a big oversized hoodie and um, big like cargo pants and Converse. Um, she has like those chains from like the 90s where everything had like metal on it, metal and leather, like chained wallet. Um, and her powers are emotional control and power negation. I'm going to go over my questions so I answer the questions right because I didn't print my playbook. I'm like a <laughs> terrible person. Um, <laughs> so uh, I've pretty much always had or she's always always had the powers. Um, and her mother is an empath. And when she was pregnant with uh, Cordelia, she actually she couldn't do anything. She thought something was wrong with her. Um, but turns out it was her fault. Um, in my free time, I like to tie knots and things that I'm not supposed to, um, like, you know, uh, wires under cars or, um, people's shoelaces, you know, that's fun. Um, I like to tag cars with little broken hearts and somehow I think I'm very clever and no one will ever figure that out. Um, <laughs> I like to skip school and sometimes if I'm feeling really angsty, I like to write poetry. The, one of the questions is, uh, who outside of the team thinks better of you than you do? And that's my mom because she does know better. Um, 
since I've been old enough to kind of control my powers, uh, I've promised that I won't shut her out. And uh, so she always knows what's going on with me. I can't get away with anything. Um, and why do I want to be a part of the team? Um, because I'm the youngest of two, I have two older brothers and they always made me feel like my powers were the absence of powers rather than doing anything good with them. So being a part of a team where they utilize my powers makes me feel like they actually do something rather than just make others do nothing. Great. Yeah. Did I get it all? <laughs> in, in terms of the power <laughs> negation, uh -huh. is that like, in terms of, is that like a field around you or is that something that you do consciously? It's a it's a more of a psychic thing, I think. It's like okay. I'm concentrating on one individual who I'm going to negate their powers. And I'm sure since, you know, I'm young, it they need to be relatively close to me. I have to, you know, it probably works better if I know them better, have kind of a connection to them. Um, but it's a very much a choice-based thing. It's not like a proximity-based thing. I just saw a beautiful GM move where like a couple of people are inside of um uh Tommy uh driving around <laughs> and things just stop working right oh no oh <laughs> and everybody comes becomes an organ or like magic school bus <laughs> uh oh <laughs> going around uh, in the intestines <laughs> take a second ride past Mars <laughs> <laughs> oh and I go by Delia cuz Cordelia Snort is a rough name to grow up with <laughs> you would be a delinquent too if that were your name. I right? You are you have doomed that child I by know. naming them that. I know. <laughs> no offense to any Cordelias that love their name. No, Snort is the problem. Snort yeah. is really yeah. the yeah. yeah. No offense to any snorts that love their name. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Amelia. Um, how about yourself? Okay. Um, so I am not gonna be as smooth on this as you guys are, because I have not done this before. Um you will do amazingly. I know it's going to be great. Um, I think, hmm, I'm trying to decide exactly where to start here. What playbook did you choose? I picked the doomed. <laughs> there you go. Got that far. Um, I think that her hero name is probably Phoenix. Mm. Feels correct. Nice. It's wishful thinking. <laughs> and bird themed. That's important. <laughs> well, right. Bird team. Um, so I think I imagine her as being um, a nerd, like a, a brainiac sort of person, um, like big glasses that are always kind of not staying up, having to constantly like push them up, up, up her nose, um, hair in like a tight bun that always has like pencils and stuff in it, which she consistently loses all the time and can never <laughs> find a pencil. And it's because there are like six of them up in her hair, which is, you know, not from real life experience or anything. Um <laughs> As I sit here with pencils in my hair. <laughs> I did it the other day. I was like, I can't find any of my pens. I can't find them anywhere. And I had like four of them stuck up in my hair. I was like, this is, it's, I mean, it's great if I need them, but I can't find them. Art imitates life. Yes, exactly. Um, and so I, I think she looks pretty unassuming most of the time, um, but sort of um, is very standoffish and kind of keeps to herself um because she knows that she has this thing going on and doesn't necessarily want to involve other people in that all the time. Mm. Um, hmm. What else do we have to decide here? Did you say what exactly your powers are? I, I think that I am going to pick memory manipulation. Nice. That's a good one. <laughs> and psychic constructs. Oh. Very good ones. Oh, that sounds very familiar. A little bit. <laughs> You coincidentally chose the ones James used. Mm -hmm. Those are really fun ones, though. What do the uh, psychic constructs look like? What does that mean to you? That's what I'm trying to decide exactly how that works within what I want to do, and I'm kind of coming up short. And so, if you have ideas, feel free to feel free to help me out here. Psychic constructs have been used in a bunch of different things. Uh, sometimes they are done as like weapons. Sometimes it's being able to like build things psychically with your mind. Um, basically it's, I mean, you can also leave it really open and just say, hey, I make things and they're purple, or I make things and they're blue, and come at me, because the Doom yeah, I mean, I, is I a, imagine that they always, whatever it is, always looks like it's made out of fire. Awesome. Yeah, that's all you need to say. 
an interesting thing that you could do that I that goes well because I've th- I've thought about this a little bit <laughs> um, that works what? well no. between psychic constructs and memory manipulation is you could say that you can psychically construct things from people's memories. Oh my god, that's so cool. That's very cool. Mm-hmm. Why can I not do that in real life? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> have you? No, tried? I was trying to think about it too. Like I like the, I have not. You know what? Good point. Just put your mind to it. <laughs> <laughs> No, because I, I, I like the concept of mem- memory manipulation as a thing. Um, I think that it could be kind of creepy and problematic. <laughs> <laughs> we have um, found that to be true. Which is, right, which is slightly concerning to me. And so I, I feel like it's a thing that she probably knows that she can do, but isn't super excited about using it very often. Nice. Um, because it feels real creepy. Um, and she wouldn't necessarily want someone doing that to her. Yeah. Um, so I think I think most of her stuff focuses on the the psychic constructs unless she absolutely has to to kind of get out of a bad situation. That's really cool. That's awesome. I'm trying to decide if she needs a real name or not. She probably does. I want to name her Beatrice, but I can't think of a last name. We'll worry about that later. Beatrice Firestone. <laughs> That's a good name. <laughs> um, what do you look like? Think. Hmm. See, this is why I like to do it ahead of time, you guys. <laughs> well, there's all kinds of really totally helpful fine. prompts. I'm, yeah, you're doing great. There's really helpful prompts. No, I'm just prompts. like a terrible decision maker in general. So I'm like, uh, Well, too look wide. down your bullet points and see if any of those like bust yeah. out at you. And then work from there. Like start with the eyes or, you know, yeah. costume or something. That usually helps me. Yeah, I mean, I feel like I imagine her as like being in a lab coat all the time for no apparent reason, because <laughs> why in high school you would need to wear a lab coat is kind of beyond me. But like, that's, I imagine her looking like that as like being um, somewhat curvy. Her figure is kind of curvy. Um, and then she's got like this lab coat on all the time. Like I said, these big glasses, hair up in a bun. Um, I think she's on the paler side um, and very freckly. Is that what she looks like as a as like a going to school kid or as a as a hero? Um, I think kind of the same. Okay. Um, which she's not super excited about and kind of bothers her that you know she doesn't ever really get to look different. Um, but I think she looks pretty normal most of the time. And then I think underneath the lab coat, it's it's a lot of jeans and t shirt. But you have to have the lab coat. <laughs> That's Gotta awesome. Have that lab coat. Right. Because you never know when you're going to have to do lab things. Also, it makes you feel kind of cool. <laughs> right. Exactly. It's like the one interesting thing. Mm-hmm. It's like, now I have this lab coat. Plus, they have big <laughs> pockets. So, you know, pick stuff up. Yeah. Right. Right. But not pens, because those are in my hair. Right. It means you could have a scene <laughs> where someone goes like, hey, who's lab coat girl? <laughs> and I like, I think that like you always have that you have to have that scene too where like you open up your closet and it's just like lab twelve coats. identical lab coats. <laughs> and then, you, like still get really upset when one of them gets burned because now I'm down to eleven of them. So do you have right. do you have like a uh like a psychically constructed costume then when you become a superhero? Like a, a fire mask or, or anything like that to conceal your identity? Um no. I think that because I, I imagine the thing about being doomed is that it's you know it'll be over eventually anyway so like what's the big deal in what's the big deal of people know who you are people knowing um i don't think it's you know that's cool doesn't really care doesn't really care also that as the doomed you can probably take them oh yeah right yeah, true. <laughs> also that also that and if you can't you could just make them forget that you were there right um i so i imagine that she's got red hair um, but then I imagine when she's using her powers, it sort of is like, looks more f- like flames than like red hair. Nice. Nice. I've got, I've got the look sorted. <laughs> <laughs> and then, so then I know that it goes, we go into like questions for backstory and stuff like that. And mine talks a lot about sanctuary. Yeah. Um, and I don't know much about that. Cool. And like w- what I want to do with that. So, uh, do you see the section just to the right of that where it says sanctuary? Mm-hmm. So that has the full description of basically what it is. And more or less what the sanctuary is, is a place that you are safe. And the GM can theoretically do things to, like, you know, worm their way in. But it's the things that make your character feel, that, that give your character a little bit of space from the fact that the, that the doom is hanging over them. Because 
guess what? There's all of these dumb teenagers that are like, hey, let's go hang out and stuff. And you don't have time for that. I mean, like you might do it sometimes, but you also have a doom at all times floating over your shoulders. Well, and so the the sanctuary can be a place that you like you go to do science work to try to like figure out how to solve the doom problem, or it can just be kind of a place where you go and get away from the pressure of the fact that there's this doom hanging over your head. So I, I think the thing that I picture is that she's really, really obsessed with the concept of entropy. Okay. And um, so I imagine this is sort of a place where she would keep all of her research, thus the lab coat, which you need to do qualitative research. Um, But I I just imagine it's like stacked with books and papers and stuff everywhere. Um, Just this side of like push pins and red string um, to sort of understand this concept of entropy and kind of stop this inevitable from happening. Is is it a lab? Um, I, I think that a portion of it is, but that's not the majority of it. Like okay. the whole thing is not, you know, a giant chemistry set or something like that. Yeah, I was just um, thinking, I, think I there's was a l- picturing like an, an abandoned laboratory that she'd taken over or something like that. But it sounds like maybe that is not the case. No, I, I think, I, I think it's sort of like more like a repurposed classroom kind of a thing. Cool. Um, there's bookshelves and all kinds of books and like a desk with papers all over it and some computers and stuff like that. And then um, kind of a little lab area in the corner with like a sink and, you know. The one sad Bunsen burner by itself. (laughs) (laughs) Well, do we want to see what uh, Ryan's character is and then maybe loop around and give you some time to think? Yeah, absolutely. Wonderful. I'm good with that. Yes, I can't wait to hear. Yeah, okay. So back in the day, like mid to late 90s and early aughts, I guess you could say, um, I played a game called Heroes Unlimited uh, by Palladium Books. Uh, I'm not sure if you are familiar with that. Oh, uh, yes. Yes. Uh, but the the Palladium system, near and dear to my heart because it is the first role-playing system that I was exposed to, uh, specifically Heroes Unlimited 1st Edition. And this was a 2nd Edition character I played uh, with my groups in a very long-running campaign uh, who unfortunately died a very uh, unfortunate and needless death. Okay. Uh, trying to save the one that she loved. Aw, that's what you need moments of truth for. It's true. And it, she died in the worst way possible. The bad guy cast a time stop spell on her that even if you saved, you were still stuck in time. Oh, no. oh geez. Oh. And so it was like, oh, you're stuck in time, but for a little less time. And it only took one round of combat for him to throw a really nasty spell at me and and end me completely. Mm. Oh, time magic in games is just like, it's the worst. It's the... Ugh. Yes. You know, I don't feel like you ever walk away from it feeling like, oh, this was good, and it definitely enhanced the story. Yeah. <laughs> like, no. It was it was a pretty Ugh. epic end, though, um, but I, I, I want to hopefully avoid that with this iteration of the character. So I'm actually playing the outsider, uh, an alien from another world, who I am naming Mishra. She is 16 years old, and she is a humanoid feline with black fur gold eyes and a tail and yeah she normally wears just you know average clothing um for her everyday stuff but she has a protective anti-gravity flight suit that does not have a helmet um that allows her to uh fly and the suit is uh skin tight enough that it can be worn under normal clothing so she normally wears it underneath her regular clothing in case she needs to use it in a pinch. Nice. And to fit in as a hero, she doesn't have a hero name yet. Uh, she's still kind of searching for that, but she never really says what her name is when she's a hero. But everybody that knows her within her hero circle knows her as Mishra. Um, she wears a, a black eye mask that matches the suit um, mm-hmm. just to kind of fit in, even though it's almost impossible to hide her true identity anyway, because. She's got this big cat head. <laughs> Who was that masked woman? <laughs> exactly. Who was that masked giant cat? No, her. that was a cat. <laughs> no. Well, it wasn't a car, so we can, we can eliminate yeah, exactly. that one possibility. <laughs> He's a chicken. Narrowed it down. Chicken. 
Um, so one of the, the, the features of my old character was that she was very stunning. Um, so I'm going to go with stunning beauty. Um, and this next one, I may need a little bit of help on. I was thinking between three different abilities that they had listed here, but, uh, knowing the conversation we had earlier, uh, might be able to even just make something up. Yeah. Um, my, my character's ability in the previous game was she was able to, I guess, kind of mimic people's fighting style so cool like after a little bit of fighting them she knew exactly how they were going to fight and was able to counter and and actually use that that form of combat and those nice. those sorts of weapons so if she's not totally skilled with ranged weapons and she gets in a firefight after you know a little bit of time she'll be able to fully understand how guns work and and how to shoot them and be effective and all that sort of stuff or in a you know uh just a a sort of fist fight with a, a martial artist or something like that um she'll be able to be on the defensive for a little bit and then totally know exactly you know how to master that combat ability yeah that definitely sounds like something you could uh choose as a power just writing that right in yeah i think that would be uh that would be awesome if i could just do that because otherwise i was thinking between alien weaponry radical shape shifting or telepathy and mind blasts and kind of yeah twisting those to be some something like that i mean one of the little secrets also is that it all follows narrative yeah so you're pretty tough can include you're pretty tough and you know how to throw a punch right and so it can include you're pretty tough and you can learn how to do martial arts stuff and stuff like that mm -hmm. so uh, but if you want it to be like a really standalone thing that has a, like a lot of kick to it, yeah. then I would put that as your other ability Yeah, I, and just write it on in and check. Cause that, yeah. that was her main thing is, uh, being able to mimic people's combat abilities and totally turn the tide of battle against them after a short period of time, which I, I thought was pretty sweet. That's yeah. super cool. Yeah. Like, yeah. So, um, got my questions answered here too. Um, so where do I come from? Um, I went ahead and made up a planet, uh, Felinar Prime, um, you <laughs> oh. know, a very comic booky name. Yeah. Um, it's a planet that's about 200 light years from earth. And why did I come to earth? Um, I actually crashed here as a child when I was 12, which was about four years ago. Um, the ship that she was traveling on was destroyed she doesn't know how it was destroyed uh but she knows that her parents were on the ship with her and they were the ones that put her in the escape pods and uh -huh. launched her out and uh they were close enough to the soul system which is our solar system um and she was able to lock on to the nearest habitable planet which was earth and she crashed there um and unfortunately Almost all of the escape pod was unsalvageable. She still has the bits and pieces of it, but has no clue how to put it all together. As a uh, 12 to 16 year old, she's been trying to figure it out, but, you know, she's kind of given up hope after a while. Uh, she doesn't know if anybody else made it off the ship. Um, and if they have, where are they? Cool. If, if, there's, if it's any consolation and any emotional support, just remember that if you do have a crash and only one person gets out, mm -hmm. someone else is probably a space pirate right now. <laughs> space pirates are fine. That should make you feel better. You've made someone's space pirate dreams come That's true. true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they got into ice road trucking. Oh, there you go. <laughs> space ice road trucking. <laughs> there are so many things in that sentence that are completely against each other, so. Yeah, Buy none it of now it makes from sense. James. Exactly. <laughs> he wrote that game. That's a game I'm working on. <laughs> <laughs> that is amazing. Space Road Trucker. All right. Advice. So why do I want to stay here for now at least? So she's kind of grown to like humans, uh, especially considering the way they treat the lesser feline creatures on this planet. <laughs> uh, she, I agree with her. Yeah, she, I like her already. She just finds it totally fascinating. Like, you've got these non-sentient feline creatures that walk on all fours and that you keep as companions this is this is crazy but awesome wait till you learn about ancient egypt Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> uh 
Yeah, but uh, she basically gave up hope of getting home a long time ago. And most recently, she has actually developed feelings for another on this strange but exciting world. Ooh. Yes. So she's kind of uh, got a little bit of a crush that wants Ooh. to keep her here. All right. Why do your people want to want me to come home? Were they to discover me on this planet, whether or not they know at this point, uh, they would want me to return home because I still have some extended family back home that were not on the ship. Uh, particularly an older brother named Fenrix, and two aunts, uh, one by blood, Arma, and one married to her, Tria. And why do I care about the team? Because they accept me for who I am, and they helped to protect me from the dangers of this world. Nice. Yeah. Fantastic. Like cars. <laughs> I like that character a lot. Dogs. And, and dogs, yeah. Yep. And dogs. <laughs> Have other of your species come to Earth before? I want to say yes, but not officially. Okay. And not, nothing that she's aware of. And uh, they're, they're certainly aware of Earth being here, but it's been kind of like a, oh, they're kind of, uh, you know, I, I don't want to say, you know, the backwards, backwater planet type deal. Um, but, the, you know, technologically inferior to her home race. Yeah. So it's it's kind of been a like let's try not to interfere if they if they find us and they reach out that'll be great but um you know let's just let them develop a little bit more before we uh interject ourselves there. You got some prime directive going on. Yeah, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> so that would be really interesting if they did find her here. That might be another reason why they want to uh bring her home. That's very true. That's some good motivation for them to do so if you uh, activate that moment of truth or use uh, a couple of the moves that put you in contact. Yeah. Oh, that's really exciting. I want to know who she fell in love with. Oh, you might find out in a little bit. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> I liked that squeal. That was really nice. Oh, yeah. That's my feels, feels noise. Give me those sweet feels. Elspeth, you were so close to the feel squeal. <laughs> oh, it was the feel squeal. You're right, oh. Brandon. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Editor James, cut that. Make me sound more clever. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for joining us for part one of this character creation series. We will be back in part two, picking up right where we left off. Character Creation Cast is a production of the Block Party Podcast Network and can be found at www.blockpartypodcastnetwork.com slash character creation cast. Head to the website to get more information on our hosts, our guests, some of our character sheets, and other shows on the network. Character Creation Cast can be found on Twitter, at CreationCast. I'm one of your hosts, Amelia Antrim, and I can be found on Twitter, at Ginger Reckoning. Our other host, Ryan Bolter, can be found on Twitter, at Lord Neptune. Music for this episode is used with a Creative Commons license, or with permission from the podcast it originated from. Further information can be found within the show notes. Our main theme music is Hero Remix by Steve Combs and is used with a Creative Commons license. This podcast is owned by us under Creative Commons. This episode was edited by Ryan Bolter. Further information for the game systems used and today's guests can also be found in the show notes. If you like the game systems discussed and wish to purchase them, links to the products can be found in the show notes. Thanks for joining us, and remember... We find the best part of any role-playing game is character creation. So go out there and create some amazing people. We'll see you next time. <laughs> <laughs>